Hello, I am the caretaker, and welcome to my catacombs of horror. the night who calls forth those terrors from beyond the grave to prowl its shadows where is the overlord of the damned beware his coming beware the return of the death master because of the popularity of the video i did on my favorite scenes from count yorga vampire i thought it was time to take a look at its sequel and in this edition, I'm going to do just that as I discuss my favorite scenes from the 1971 film, The Return of Count Yorga. Now, Robert Quarry was not the only one returning from the original film as the title character. Edward Walsh reprises his role as Bruda, Yorga's valet. Roger Perry, who played Dr. Hayes in the first film, is here now playing Dr. David Baldwin. George McCready, who was the narrator of the first film, plays Professor Reitstadt, and Bob Kelgen is back as the director and co-writer of the film. There's quite a cast in this film as well, many of whom would go on to have incredible careers. First, there's Marriott Hartley, who plays Yorga's love interest, Cynthia. She appeared on such classic shows like Ben Casey, The Twilight Zone, The Bob Newhart Show, just to name a few, and most recently, 911. Then there's Michael Pataki, who plays Joey. His list of credits is absolutely insane. Uh, from Bonanza, Easy Rider, Beretta, Happy Days, and of course, Rocky IV and Halloween IV, just to name a few. What's also interesting to note, like their co-star Roger Perry, both Pataki and Hartley were both guest stars on the original Star Trek. Just a little bit of trivia. Rounding out the cast, you have Yvonne Wilder as the mute Jennifer. Yvonne also co-wrote the script with Kelgen, and you also have Tommy Toner as Reverend Thomas, Philip Frame as Tommy, and making his feature film debut, Craig T. Nelson as Sergeant O'Connor. It'll be a little while before Poltergeist and Coach come knocking on his door. Now that I got all that out of the way, let's get into the film. First, I want to remind you that I'll be discussing the entire film, so if you don't want anything ruined, you should turn back now and come back after seeing the movie. You have been warned. When putting this together, I listened to some of the commentary track on the Blu-ray, and there was an interesting story about Bob Kelgen presenting the script to the producers. Uh, the script was quite large. I believe it was somewhere in the 100 to 110 page range, and uh, that's a lot for a horror movie. Now, for those of you that don't know, usually one page of a script equals one minute of screen time. That's a general rule, of course. There used to be a, a joke. Uh, Moses parts the Red Sea was only an eighth of a page. So, um, you know, again, uh, it's, a, it's a very general rule, but, but pretty accurate. Uh, the reason Kelgen presented such a large script uh, to the producers was because he actually included a lot of screen direction and other notes outside of the story and dialogue. So that's why he wanted to assure the producers that the movie was not going to be as long as the script appeared. Another interesting thing about this film is its use of humor. Um, there's a lot more light moments in this film as opposed to Count Yorga Vampire, almost to a fault, and we'll see why a little later on. It's about time they release these soundtracks. Uh, it, it's, I, I don't know why it's so hard to get these. Oh yeah, it never hurts to have Bill Butler shoot your movie. <laughs> I mean, he would only go on to, uh, I don't know. <laughs> become one of the greatest cinematographers of all time. The Conversation, Jaws, <laughs> Damien Omen 2, Grease, Rocky 2, 3, and 4. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> my goodness. Child's Play, yeah. yeah. He did a few movies. So our movie starts, we have Cynthia uh, just kind of on her own at the orphanage here. Just kind of listening. It's very unusual for a uh, horror movie. It's uh, very existential. And she's now joined by uh, Reverend Thomas. And um, she's telling him that she can hear the Santa Ana winds, the howling of, of the Santa Anas. What's interesting is that it makes her into a very different character here. Um, she's very in tune with her environment. 
with everything around her. She's picking up things that no one else is picking up. Almost very vampiric. Ah. Now I hear them. I wish you hadn't made me. And of course, uh, those of us that live here in California know the Santa Ana's very, very well. Uh, it makes sense because at the time of year, um, this is uh, right around Halloween, and uh, the Santa Ana's uh, appear in uh, fall, autumn, and um, they're very warm and dry winds that come through. They kind of have an ominous quality about them, the winds. So it's kind of setting up already uh, something is not right. Right, you have this picturesque scene here, which is supposed to be Northern California, but I believe they shot this more, uh, more in the area of Santa Barbara. I think Santa Barbara is about an, uh, 90 minutes north of uh, Los Angeles, a lot closer than San Francisco. Depending on how, fa how fast you drive to San Francisco or what route, uh, it could take you anywhere from five and a half to about seven or eight hours, depending. So here we have uh, young Tommy running around playing uh, kind of kickball. He's just kind of running around like a kid. And, uh, uh oh. Well, that's never a good sign. <laughs> the movie opens kind of like we're already an hour into another movie. It just kind of just picks up, which is great. Dun, dun, dun. What I love about this movie is that it doesn't even bother to explain how Yorga came back. Because the last time we saw him, he was a, he was a pile of dust. And now, not only has he returned, um, and we soon find out that his valet, Bruda, is with him as well, who, who we all thought died in uh, the first film as well. Uh, they're all alive and well in the Bay Area. And I love the idea that they don't describe why, how, any of it. He's been there a while, apparently, because you got all, these, uh, all of his vampire brides coming out of the ground. It's And now we see Cynthia with, uh, with her fiancé, Dr. Baldwin. And something's upsetting her, and now she goes. Damn it. Damn it. Damn the winds. Damn the bridge. Damn everything. You're much too attractive to be so bitter. Oh. You startled me. Forgive me. And there he is, in all of his glory, Robert Quarry. And what's great about this scene is that you have Yorga pouring on the charm here. He's already smitten with Cynthia. You mean a real count? Yes. Oh, how marvelous. And that isn't a costume. No. Oh, forgive me, that was thoughtless. Not at all. How were you able to get here with the bridge out? I flew. <laughs> I, of no, course he flew. He's a vampire. <laughs> I recently acquired the old gateway man. <laughs> so now we kind of set up our other characters, uh, Cynthia's uh, sister and her sister's fiance. Now again, here, <laughs> here we go again. <laughs> Yorka's disdain. You like this kind of music? Even played well. <laughs> it's just so good. His line delivery is just so flat and just perfect. And then, and then of course, you have this guy, the overdone vampire. <laughs> How great is that? That's what I love about this. The humor that's done in, in this is so well, again, to a point, because then it kind of goes off the rails a little bit. But now we have, hey, Dr. Hayes, you look familiar. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. Dr. Baldwin. Yes, 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 of course. Um, so now we have the meeting and, of course, Yorga just hating humans. The winds of Santa Ana are world famous. And then right here, you know, instead of instead of just attacking her finger, he just very gently An old Bulgarian takes the blood off her finger. It's really it's it's a really good scene. Oh yeah, here's the other. <laughs> this is good. I can't remember when I've had such fun. Oh, you must live a very exciting life. Oh, another vampire. Where are your fangs? Where are your manners? 
<laughs> and I love Robert Corey's reaction at first, Yorga's reaction when she starts touching him. And he's just kind of like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> He's kind of thrown by it. It's 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 very well done. It humanizes Yorga as much as you're going to see in, in in either film. And there he is again. He's just kind of floating in the background. He's always on the periphery. He's just kind of there. It really well done with Bob Kelgen's direction there. Just having Yorga just kind of floating in the back. That was actually the first time I really noticed it while while recording this sequence. <laughs> <laughs> and of course the fake vampire <laughs> wins the costume party <laughs> and Yorka has fun with it now this is one of the sequences that we are kind of familiar with this was uh, you know sort of a callback to the uh, original film the whole idea of do vampires exist have you seen them you know we've seen this part already so let's skip through this sequence of course, someone tries to take a photo of the group, and Yorga goes full cape as now his victim has been discovered in the hallway. And while the group tries to find out what happened to Mitzi, Yorga just goes about his business back to his abode, which is not too far from the orphanage. I just love how, how simple those doors just open up. And there's Bruda. Oh, not so dead after all. You know, it's just so interesting watching Robert Quarry's body movements in this in this film as well as Count Yorga because it's not easy to just not move like that. Try doing that. It's a very controlled movement. Very little bit with the head, very slow walking, shoulders are back. There's just a command of it that kind of gets overlooked. It's very, very different. Yorga enters a room very differently than Lugosi would enter a room as Dracula, Lee would enter a room as Dracula, Frank Langella entering a room in Dracula. I always think about that sequence when he comes in, when Langella uh, comes into the dinner sequence, and he just kind of breezes right on in. Yorga would never do that. Now, it's to be noted that this film was uh, not too long after the Charles Manson murders that happened in Los Angeles. And this and the Death Master uh, movie were both influenced by uh, the Manson murders. Uh, Death Master, uh, Robert Quarry plays a vampire who is uh, very Charles Manson-like in, in, in his approach, how he looks. Um, this sequence right here is more along the lines of the actual murder scene itself. This is a very intense scene, and... Um, I'm sure, too, at the time, pretty shocking. But again, we have this callback to the Santa Ana winds. And I love that little touch that's added to this movie. It could just have been very simple. You know, here are people, and these vampires are there, and they're killing people, and, you know, that's the end. Instead, you have this whole buildup of the Santa Ana winds with, you know, uh, this mysterious attack on this woman. People are a little freaked out. I grant you that uh, night winds do stir the imagination. But you three behaving like summertime in the ghetto. Don't you sense a strangeness? An unwanted curiosity? Unwanted curiosity? <laughs> what kind I mean, of Kelsey does a really that? solid job setting this up. I can tell you right now, having lived through some of these Santa Ana winds, it can get a little rough. I mean, you could be sitting in your in your room, and all of a sudden, you, the wind just starts going crazy outside. So uh, this is not an over exaggeration. You're starting to build this tension, right? You have the winds, you have the tree branches moving, you have things bumping in the night. Oh come on, honey. You're trembling. Listen, Ellen, go get your mother a shawl, and I want you to wake Tommy and bring Jennifer in here. Right. 
and Tommy, who has appeared to become a pawn for Yorga and his vampire brides. He uh, is definitely under their influence, and he's uh, sort of the... Uh, He's sort of become the bad news. If you see him coming, <laughs> there's nothing good coming behind him, as we're about to find out here. Good jump scare right there. And again, this is like, you know, we're, what, five minutes into this, and it's still kind of just... It's not going away. The scene is, is building. was it you all made me so afraid it's drawing itself to a conclusion. Marsh, I'm gonna take a look around outside. Because now Please even stay, he's go. freaked Please. out. What's the matter? All right, all right, take it easy. Take it easy. Is anything wrong? No, darling, nothing's wrong. Where's Jennifer? And now, now it begins. It has a bit of a Night of the Living Dead quality to it to start. I wanted to let that scene play out without saying anything because it's it's so intense and so real. And the sound design is so minimal, right? You have really it's the screams of the family as they're being murdered with a little bit of it almost sounded like bats squeaking underneath. Very minimal. Incredibly effective sequence. I think Filmmakers need to see something like that to understand the true power of a scene without having blasting music and blasting sound design. It's incredibly effective. So Cynthia is brought back to Yorga's mansion and he does to her what he did in the first film. He's going to get her to not remember the attack at the house. All you will remember is an automobile accident. An accident that occurred in front of my home. And that we, you and I, are friends. I love how he says friends. Cynthia. Who's that? Shot so well. Mount Yorga. It's like a Michael Corleone shot almost. So Cynthia uh, thinks that she was in a car accident uh, by herself. Yorga tells her that her family was notified. She asks if she can call them, and he says, it's too late. Don't bother tonight. Let's try tomorrow. Meanwhile, Jennifer goes out to Cynthia's family's home and discovers the carnage. The police arrive at the house in the morning to inspect the crime scene. Hey, there he is, Craig T. Nelson. They bring Jennifer back into the house, and there's nothing there. Rut row. Where'd everybody go? So, of course, Jennifer's insisting that something happened. Of course, they planted a letter there, making it seem like the family was leaving because of a sick relative. So Jennifer, of course, wants Tommy to validate what she saw. And Tommy, being under the influence of Count Yorga, is saying that the family did leave. Where to? I don't know. Meanwhile, Bruda does what Bruda does. Cleaning up the mess. 
You know, it's always convenient to have quicksand in your backyard. <laughs> Hello? Ugh, that would have been awkward. Hey, what are you doing down there, Bruda? Uh, just pushing your parents down the quicksand. <laughs> oh, well, tell them hello. All right, I'm going to go have breakfast. All right, no problem, bye. <laughs> now, as I mentioned, uh, as you see here, uh, looks like San Francisco. That is nowhere near Santa Barbara. That's about four hours north. Discrepancies. That's a great shot. Of course, you see a lot of photos from that side. Ah, San Francisco. So this, again, kind of calls back to Count Yorga Vampire, right? Where we have, you know, the guys walking around talking about Yorga. Is he a vampire? Isn't he a vampire? What happened? And it leads up to this next scene with uh, George McCready, who was the narrator in the original. He's uh, playing this character, Professor Reitstadt. And when I talked about humor kind of to a fault, that would be this scene. Now, I said this in my previous video, and I'll say it again. What I really enjoy about these films is um, there is no Van Helsing, right? And now here we have Professor Reitstadt, who's supposedly a Van Helsing-style character. But then it kind of goes down this weird sort of silly bit where it's like Yorga, Yoga, Yorga, Yoga, Uma, Oprah. Some of you will get that reference. But it's kind of, it's kind of, I don't know. It's kind of weird. It feels very misplaced. Where's, where's the closing circle to end the scene? Not my favorite. I think we could have done without that, but that's all right. Meanwhile, we kind of have this disturbing scene with Tommy and this other boy where they're fighting over the ball. And Jennifer uh, looks out to see Tommy getting rough with the kid and pushing him down. And then basically like going to kill him with this rock. He's going to smash his head with this thing. Jennifer thankfully intervenes. So Jennifer goes after Tommy, follows him to Yorga's mansion. What a great electronic sting. Very, very Night of the Living Dead-like. Again. Or maybe um, Shockwaves. Which was years from, from this movie, after this movie. Now, this is a very interesting scene here. We have this witch. I must find out if I I, I, I'm not really sure, right? Like, who is she? What is their relationship? When she discovers what you are, she'll sicken at your name. She will loathe you. Kill her. If you do not, you may never see another moon. She speaks to him very candidly. So whoever she is, there's some strong relationship there. I love that Yorga drives. <laughs> Obviously, they can't spend the money to do the, to do the bad effect. Um, but I love the idea that he drives. When did you ever see Dracula drive? And don't count a horse and, uh, and, and carriage. That doesn't count. When did you see Count Dracula get into a cool car like that and go? yorga has got business to do. So he goes to find Joey and Mitzi at this hippie bar. Those damn hippies up in the Bay Area. <laughs> so Joey and Mitzi go back to their really cool boat back at the dock to spend the night. And of course, you know, you got a little technical issues going on with the electric, so... Eh, Joey's got to go outside and take a look. And again, not a lot going on here. And then boom! A great jump scare right there. And I love the idea of the whale. <laughs> the whale cries. It's so odd, but it works so well. And it's so unusual. So this is kind of reminiscent of Count Yorga Vampire a little bit when he attacked Erica. Meanwhile, Reverend Thomas, Jennifer, Dr. Baldwin, and Jason are all asking Tommy why he was at Count Yorga's, and he denies it. And he's basically saying that uh, Jennifer is imagining it, and he's not sure why she would lie. 
pushing Jennifer farther away from him. And of course, Jennifer does not appreciate that. Meanwhile, our witch visits Cynthia in her room. Get out. Now, was she there to kill her? Probably. But Yorga doesn't do anything. He just tells her to get out. He doesn't try to attack her. He doesn't get physical with her. He doesn't, he doesn't express any dominance over her. So there is an obvious strong relationship going on between those two. Tommy then lures Jason over to Count Yorga's house, where it's movie night at the Yorga residence. Hey, what do you think they're watching? Oh, come on now. <laughs> a, little, a nice little callback to Hammer. <laughs> this, is, this is fun. And you know, what's interesting is that he's watching it in Spanish. Uh, the Vampire Lovers, one of the great Hammer horror films. What was uh, brought up uh, on the commentary uh, track of this disc was Hammer Horror, actually. And it wasn't for this scene. It was actually much earlier. And discussing how good Hammer was at gothic vampire horror. The problem that Hammer had was trying to bring it into the present day. And we know that because Dracula AD 1972 is not that good. And Satanic Rites of Dracula is really not good. There's some some good sequences in it, but I mean, both movies are not really that great. And Hammer always struggled when it came to that. Whereas Count Yorga and Blackula are two modern day vampire movies that work so well that, you know, it's something that you just, you know, you just never got from Hammer. So the trap is being set for Jason as young Tommy brings him to, well, he thinks he's going to be meeting Helen. And of course, like I said, where Tommy goes, trouble follows. Hello, Jason, darling. Helen. That's never a good look. <laughs> I'd be like, um, Ellen, you just stay right there. I'll be right back. <laughs> You're frightened. You don't love your Ellen anymore. Well, I liked Ellen a lot when she didn't have fangs. How's that? <laughs> Ellen. <laughs> Ellen. out a little bit like uh, Count Yorga with Dr. Hayes where he has the three vampires behind him. Now, okay, I know that this sequence can get laughed at by people. I've been in the room when some people have just laughed out loud when they've seen it. Because of the because of Yorga running in slow motion, I think it's an effective sequence. I think it works. I think Quarry sells it as best he can. And between the music and the slow motion, I think it works. Write your comments below. Let me know if you think this sequence is good or not. I like it, and I stand by it. Really scared the hell out of me as a kid. So Jason's toast. Bruda feeds him to the women. Why Cynthia is ready to get the hell out of Dodge, and she knows Yorg is holding her against her will. Yeah, now. I have survived many, many years. Yorga is basically, oh, you know, you making himself vulnerable here. The most fragile emotion ever known has entered my life. You, Cynthia, have brought to my life a gentle pain which I can only define as love. Can you love me? Boys, have either of you seen Jennifer? 
No, sir. Not me, sir. All right, you can go. Seems as though Tommy has uh, finally done in Jennifer. We were idiots to have waited so long. So in the meantime, Dr. Baldwin, our reverend, and our two detectives are heading towards Yorga's mansion, and they need to get inside, very similar to Count Yorga Vampire, and this time, though, the doctor and the detectives are going in the mansion one way, Reverend Thomas is going to play decoy and speak with Count Yorga about fundraising. What a pleasant surprise. Excuse me, Count Jorga, it's uh, so very late. I do hope you don't mind. Not at all. Please don't, uh, don't get up. Thank you. <laughs> I love that. Make oh, yeah, no, I wasn't planning on it. <laughs> very kind of you. Uh, it's just so funny. It's just like, I, I'm not getting up. So... It's almost like Count Jorga's just like, I don't care if you're a priest, a reverend, I don't care if you're the Pope, I'm not standing up. So while the reverend is trying to distract Jorga, <laughs> Jorga's going to distract the reverend. He's going to distract him by having him walk in his garden, and we all know Jorga's garden isn't exactly <laughs> a fun place to be. And he's going to distract him with money. I haven't had the opportunity to give it much care. I've been here such a short time. I somehow like it this way. Wild, unkept. It gives you a free feeling. Count, would you help me, please? I've hit a loose spot. Count Yorga, please. I'm having difficulty, please. Count Yorga, in heaven's name, please. What? You... You led me to this. This was your purpose. In the name of God, man, please. What? You devil. You vampire. You never intended donating that money. You sick, tormented monster. You'll never get away with this. There. There, you madman. How do you like that? <laughs> What a well-shot sequence. I mean, it's all in one take. I would have loved to have been there to see how they did that. And Yorga being Yorga, he doesn't have to say anything. It's right there for you to see. The doctor and our detectives gain access to the house. While we have the game of cat and mouse inside the mansion. That music cue is a little callback to Count Yorga. Well, found Jason. Jason. Chief, I sure would like to get the hell out of here. Yeah? Oh, uh, Tommy out. looming in the distance. Uh-oh. Time to eat. I mean, Yorga has a much more high-tech mansion in this movie than he did in the first one. That's all that Silicon Valley <laughs> technology. <laughs> oh, this is a little bit before then, but anyway. Last thing I'd ever want to do is run around the mansion of a vampire. Listen. Hey, you down there. We'd like to talk to you. So this is, again, another one of those kind of humorous moments. Know. Well, let's talk to them. They might know something. Now, please don't be nervous or Frank. We're not here to harm you. We're from the police department and just want to ask a few questions. I'm Lieutenant Madden, and this here is my assistant, Sergeant O'Connor. And I don't think this was a very good idea. Anyway, <laughs> I must warn you that the law states that anything you might say may be used against you, Chief. and so forth, and like it goes. Chief, I think we have a split. Yes, good. A little Abbott and Costello moment there. 
But, you know, unlike the Professor Wrightstadt scene, it, this actually worked well. Because you could see something like that kind of working in that moment. So, of course, all hell's breaking loose now. And Baldwin finds Cynthia. And a kind of a callback to uh, Count Yorgo with Donna in the bedroom. Is your family here? I don't know. Come on. Back. Yeah, that doesn't work with Bruda. <laughs> no. But I guess if I were him and I was in a panic, I probably would have done the same thing. <laughs> Although, you know, if the sticks don't work, I don't think the fingers are going to work. <laughs> hey. All right, so Baldwin takes out Bruda for the moment, gets Cynthia and tear asses out of there. In the meantime, our detectives are also trying to get the hell out of Dodge, and they run into Bruda. And this plays like an Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein moment. <laughs> and if you you know what I'm talking about, if you've seen the movie, in the bedroom. When Frankenstein and Dracula are battling and <laughs> they're running from Frankenstein. <laughs> I mean, this is almost like a callback to that scene. I've got to warn you. We're prepared to open fire. But of course, in the Yorga Mansion, you always got to look behind you because there's always something creeping up. Well, meanwhile, our detectives are trying to figure out how to get the hell out of here. And I think this time, Bruda finally dies. Not dies. Well, this time I have to assume Bruda's dead because, well, they never made a third. Uh, Yorga just traveling up an elevator. It's just so random. Uh, 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 Yorga's in an elevator, driving a car. Okay, so now we get a better look at our witch. Great, great, great effect. So it looks like our witch, after all, was really a vampire. But was she a vampire that's a witch? A witch who became a vampire? And again, we don't know the relationship between her and Yorga. And we never will. And I like that. It doesn't need to be said. <laughs> Lieutenant Madden thinks he hears Baldwin, but it's not. Uh! And instead... Looks like Tommy took him out. Like he did Jennifer. Dr. Baldwin, this is Count Jorga. You are going to die. You are going to die a most horrible death. You've been a fool, Doctor, and now you are to die. is killer. <laughs> and things are looking pretty bleak. That's not exactly where you want to be. Uh, 
And unfortunately for poor Dr. Baldwin, he's at the end of the line. Great shooting here, getting in tight. Wait a minute. That's <laughs> such a great look. How did Baldwin get out of there? Well, the final chase begins. <laughs> Love the Yorga growl. So guttural. And of course, now all the memories are flooding back to Cynthia about what really happened to her family. Great cut sequence here. with all that rush of memories brings back all this rush of emotions and realizing what happened well Cynthia's gonna do what she needs to do and that is kill Yorga and the witch was right his what he thought was love for her, this is undoing. Ball was just going to help him out here. See ya. David. So, of course, it wouldn't be a Yorga movie if there wasn't the old flipperoo, switcheroo, do si do where Donna was the vampire at the end of Count Yorga. Baldwin is now the vampire. And then Tommy just goes and has fun running around. So there's a lot to dissect here. Um, so who now leads the vampires? Is it the witch who's the vampire or the vampire who's a witch? Is it, well, it can't be Baldwin. He just became a vampire. Certainly not Cynthia. She too just became a vampire. So a lot of questions. A lot of people survived. I mean, when you think about it, Ellen and the witch, uh, obviously um, uh, Mitzi, there's a lot of survivors from this film. So there you have it. Uh, a look back at... The Return of Count Yorga, some of my favorite scenes. I hope you enjoyed looking back at this movie. And uh, if you've never seen the film before, um, hopefully you will go and watch the whole movie in its entirety. And um, if you have seen it before and it just reminded you how much you liked it, uh, go on back, take a look at it. I always uh, look forward to your uh, comments below. And um, of course, if you did not see... Uh, my previous Catacombs of Horror are my favorite scenes from Count Yorga Vampire. The link is included below as well. Check it out. I would uh, love to get your take on that as well. And there are the other two episodes as well. One on what best represents 1980s horror in four categories. David Weiner, the director of the In Search of Darkness series, joins me. And we pick what we think best represents 1980s horror in four different categories. And my favorite scenes from Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers, as well as the missed opportunity that the series could have taken and why I think Halloween 4 is the most important film outside of the original. I also invite you to join me inside my graveyard on the Graveyard Show podcast where I interview people from the world of horror. 
Thank you for joining me inside my catacombs of horror. I look forward to seeing you again very soon. <laughs>